Just a quick note before we get into the challenge, 80% of people who watch these challenges in May were not subscribed to the channel. If even one in every five people who watch this video take two seconds to click that subscribe button, we could break the 100k mark and make a huge impact in the Pokemon community towards more fun and creative content. But I can't do it alone. If you enjoy these videos, double check that you've hit the subscribe button so you don't miss future challenges. Let's see what you guys are capable of as a community. Thanks guys, enjoy the video. Welcome everyone, my name's Sof, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Emerald with only Dark-type Pokemon. Oh, you think darkness is your ally? Today, I'm gonna leave our encounters as a mystery, but I will tell you that there are seven total fully evolved Pokemon we can obtain. There is an eighth Dark-type in Emerald, Houndoom's line, but unfortunately it's only available in areas 5 and 6 in the Safari Zone, which don't unlock until after you've beaten the Elite Four. The Dark type is usually considered to be quite good, however in Gen 3 because of the physical special split not being a thing yet, types themselves were either physical or special, and Dark is special in this generation. Unfortunately, as we'll see, the majority of Dark type Pokemon in Gen 3 have great physical attack so it just does not work out, adding an extra challenge for sure. As always, the full rule set for this run is in the description, but basically only the first dark type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except held items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next gym leader or Elite Four's ace. And finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. Let's do this. Ah, Pokemon Emerald, one of my favorite Pokemon games of all time. Something that's always confused me though, yes, there's the whole shoving your kid in the back of the moving truck thing, but also this is the only game in which your father is present, and yet there's only the main floor and the protagonist's bedroom. Where do the parents sleep? That kitchen table has seen some things. You know what? So have those Vigoroth. Anyway, since we can't get a dark type, we have to start off the game with one of the regular starters, so I picked Trico. It might very well be my favorite, but it also causes Mei to pick Torchic, which will eventually get the fighting type, so it adds an extra challenge against a dark type team. After destroying Mei's hopes and dreams on Route 103 and getting some Pokeballs, it's game time. Our first dark encounter comes in the form of Route 103, which I decided to come back to since they have slightly higher level Pokemon on average, where we find a level 3 Puchiina. Level 2s are risky to level up early game, so I'm satisfied. We catch it and nickname it Shenzi. Shenzi ends up having a careful nature, plus special defense, and minus special attack. That's kind of bad, at least for its stab dark moves. Since I know Shenzi will have to be some sort of mixed attacker if we're to make any use of stab, I grind up against Zigzagoon, Puchina, and Ralts for speed, attack and special attack EVs until we reach level 7. At this level, I'm feeling safe to find our second encounter on Route 102. Now, Emerald is a very strange game in this regard. The entire CDOT line are exceedingly rare, only being a 1% encounter in the entire game. It takes a while, but eventually we find one, catch it, and name it Deku. Deku has a sassy nature, plus special defense and minus speed, not the best since speed is critical. Now it's worth noting that Deku doesn't have the dark type yet. As per our rules, we're allowed to catch it since it eventually does get the dark type, but we can't use it in battle until it evolves. For now, Deku's just moral support. After watching Wally catch a Pokemon because he can't stand two feet from the city alone, also look at Wally's signature Pokemon and think about the kind of team that we're gonna have. The poor kid. We arrive at the entrance to the Petalburg Woods. This girl says, hello is the beginning of goodbye. Damn man, that's deep and kind of fatalistic. Go seek help. The Petalburg Woods go relatively smoothly, although we had a close encounter with a trainer who had two super effective Leech Life Ninkata, but thankfully a combination of using Howl to raise our attack, an Orinberry, and a last minute crit saved the day. Now on Route 104, I almost lost the run entirely, but caught myself at the last moment. There's a double battle on the bridge that you have to walk through, and we of course have two Pokemon on our party, but if CDOT is sent in, we would have lost the run. Not to mention it would have gotten KO'd anyway. So I went back to Petalburg to deposit it, after which we can walk by without triggering the battle since we only have one Pokemon. Good thing I caught that. With that, we arrive in Rustboro City with Shenzi at level 12. With the Rustboro Gym's level cap at 15, I decide to head northwest to train up on Route 116. During one of the battles, Shenzi levels up to 13 where she learns Bite, which is going to be absolutely crucial, and you'll see why. I also thankfully researched the trainers on this route ahead of time and was able to dodge a trainer who had a Machop, which I think would have ended our run immediately. After getting to high level 14, it's time for the Rustboro City Gym. Now, rock types, one would imagine would be a very difficult threat for something like a Puchiina, but in this instance, the lack of the physical special split actually helps us, as Bite is a special move, and most of the gym Pokemon have really low special
special defense. This makes the gym trainers a pretty easy task. However, there was one thing I forgot about. In Emerald, they add trainers to the gym, and in this case, I ran into a spot that activates two consecutive battles. I had leveled up Shenzi according to the two trainers Ruby and Sapphire have, but thankfully we make it just below the level cap at high level 15 after the second unavoidable battle. Damn, that was close. It's time for gym leader Roxanne. Even with an Orenberry on Shenzi, Roxanne is a scary threat for us since we have a minus special attack nature, but there's not much more we can do to prepare. She leads with a Geodude and I go for Bite, which actually gets the flinch right away. Nice. We're then able to hit it again, but it barely survives. Seriously, that must be like 1 HP, and it hits us with Rock Tomb for a third damage and also drops our speed. After a potion, she's then able to be taken down in two more hits, after which Puchina levels up. Don't forget that her Pokemon have to be at or below the level cap at the start of battle, but level Leveling up mid-battle is allowed as per the rules. In comes the second Geodude which gets hit below half by Bite, then gets off another Rock Tomb to bring us to one third and drop our speed again. But our Orenberry brings us just above half before we can take it out with a second Bite. Now comes what I'm most scared of in my life, Nose Pass, which has a whopping 90 special defense. It now outspeeds us because of the drops, which is terrible since we now can't flinch with Bite. But thankfully it just uses Harden on its first turn, but Bite does like nothing. That's even less than I thought. It then uses Block, I'm not sure why, and we hit it again, after which it hits us with Tackle to 16 HP. We bring it below half, but its Orenberry brings it back above. This is not good. But its next Tackle actually missed, and then I hit it with Sand Attack. That was kind of funny. Realizing the desperate situation we're in, I know we have to lower its accuracy, as all of its moves range from 80 to 95% accuracy. It goes for Harden yet again, and we bring it below half, but then Roxanne uses a Potion to almost full health. Oh boy. Another tackle hits successfully to 9 HP, but then we get a critical hit, it misses Rock Tomb, and we can take it out. My god, that was close. One Rock Tomb would have ended us, but the sand attack pulled through in the end. First gym badge miraculously acquired. If we hadn't had our speed dropped, we would have likely flinched the stupid nose pass a few times, but man, that battle was set up for us to lose. While leaving Rustboro City, we're challenged by May, but it is an optional battle, so we're gonna leave it be. Oh, what's the matter? Haven't caught or raised your Pokemon very much? That's not very good for a trainer. May, I don't want to swear in front of those children over there, but shut the f*** up! I end up teaching Cut to our very conveniently named Zigzagoon we caught for HMs because there's something in the Petalburg Woods I think we're definitely going to need later on. The Miracle Seed to boost Grass-type moves. Along the way to Doofurd, Puchina ends up evolving as well into a beastly Mighty Ina which also has the Intimidate ability, one of the best in the game. Before anything, I head to the Granite Cave to pick up Steven's package, alright come on now, stay with me, which I then go all the way back to Rustboro to deliver to his father because he gives us the experience share in return which we can now put on Seedaw to level him up and eventually make him usable through evolving. After stocking up on a crap ton of Pokeballs, it's time to head for our next encounter back in Granite Cave. Now before we find this thing, can I just note how impossible the next gym looks on the face of it? It's a fighting gym and we're gonna have maximum two dark types. But our savior has arrived, Sableye. After a ton of Pokeballs, due to this thing's terrible capture rate, we successfully catch it and name it Veil. Veil ends up having a naive nature, which is neutral, and I'm fine with that. Sableye gets stabbed from Ghost and Dark-type moves, which are physical and special respectively, so we don't want either attack stat to be lowered, really. After a ton of grinding with the experience share, Seedot finally evolves into the Grass Dark Nuzleaf so he can finally be used in battle. I ended up teaching the Bullet Seed TM we got from Route 104 and put the Miracle Seed on to boost its power. Wanna know why? Neither Seedot, nor Nuzleaf, nor Shiftry learn a single Grass attacking move by level up. Not a single one. What the f***, Game Freak? The Doofer Gym is scary on the face of it, but look at Brawly's team. Do you see a problem? Yup. He only has fighting moves, and we have a part ghost type. Vale is able to absolutely slaughter everything on his team because they just can't touch him. Incredible. This might have very well saved the run and makes what would have been the hardest gym leader the easiest. Amazing. After defeating Team Aqua and Slateport, this grunt gives us a TM and says, It suits you more than me. Well, what TM is it? Oh, you son of a... Oh well, useful for a dark team at least. On Route 110, we have another battle with Mei, although it's made quite easy with the help of Sableye, who, with a combination of Fake Out and Nightshade, takes down Wingle, handles Combuskin with Nightshade since it can only use the special Ember move on us, and Lombre just uses Absorb and Nature Power, which turns into Swift and can't hit us. Honestly, this thing is a legend already. After spanking Wally in battle, he proceeds to call us like 15 seconds later. 
Excuse me, sir, do you have any experience in dealing with stalkers? Before the Mauville Gym, I decided to go past Verdenturf Town to get the black glasses, which are pretty much the ideal item for our team. Following the trainers in Watson's Gym, I was feeling pretty okay about our chances, but while researching, I remembered just how much of an upgrade Watson's team got in Emerald over Ruby and Sapphire. He now has an extra Pokemon, and it just so happens to be a level 24 Manetric with a Citrus Berry. Well, let me just say I severely underestimated Watson, or perhaps overestimated our team. And he set a new record for our challenges. I had to wipe five times against him. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Nuzlocke terminology, that means restarting the entire game from scratch just to get back to him since when Pokemon faint, they're dead, and if all of your Pokemon die, that's it. The run is over and you have to wipe. I believe the previous record was three wipes for Fantina and Platinum with only fighting types, so congratulations Watson, you sick f You know what's bad when the best strategy I have involves getting the TM for Attract from the Verdanturf Contest Hall out of desperation, but let's try it. Before battle, he says, What are you doing here? Are you saying you made it past my rigged doors? Watson, you literally watched me come through and approach you. My strategy for Watson involves putting a Cherry Berry on every one of our Pokemon since he loves to paralyze everything in his sight. He leads with Voltorb and I lead with Sableye for one reason. This thing has self-destruct which can't affect him and we need to conserve Mightyena's health for the late battle. I hit him with the Fake Out on the first turn and after getting hit by one spark, unfortunately we bring him just into potion range with our Nightshade. We hit him again to below half and he hits us with Shockwave to below half, but then our next Nightshade leaves him with 1 HP. No way. He can then go for another spark to bring us to 14 HP and paralyzes us, but thankfully our Cherry Berry cures us and Astonish can take him out. Damn, that was an unlucky first Pokemon. He next sends out Electrike and we're definitely in KO range, so I switch in Mightyena here who gets hit by a Shockwave for about a quarter damage. Now the reason I sent Mightyena in instead of Nuzleaf is because Electrike is male and Shenzi is female, so we could use Attract on it. And here, as I quickly found out, we need to get as many Howls off as we can to increase our attack for what's to come. On the first turn, Electrike isn't immobilized by Attract and hits us to just above half, then it uses Howl on itself on the next three turns it can move, ironically enough. We get five Howls off in total, and that's all I'm willing to risk, so I start to hit him with Bite 2 to add the Flinch Chance combined with the Attract, which works well and we can take him out in two hits and level up. In comes Magneton, the reason we got all those Howls off, and the reason we gave Mightyena Rock Smash in the first place, otherwise nothing can touch him. Rock Smash does about two-thirds, and Magneton just goes for Thunder. Thunderwave, thankfully, which our Cherry Berry heals, and we can take him out on the next turn. It's time. Manectric. He goes for Howl on the first turn as I go for one more Howl to max out our attack, as I've noticed like Electrike, he tends to follow suit. But then, he hits us with Thunderwave, and we no longer have a Berry. He then goes for Howl again, which isn't good since he has priority quick attack, and we get fully paralyzed two turns in a row, so he's able to charge up his attack hugely. Thankfully, on the third turn, we can land an attract since Manetric is also male. He gets yet another Howl off next, though, and we hit him with Rock Smash for about a third. He then goes for Quick Attack, and amazingly we survive on 17 HP and hit him again to a quarter, but his Citrus Berry activates to bring him to three quarters. Here, I had to make a huge risk and go for Rock Smash and hope he was immobilized, and he was, and Rock Smash brings him into the red, but doesn't kill. Knowing Watson will Super Potion, I take the opportunity to switch into Sableye so we can get a free Fake Out off. Now here, I know he's stuck going for an electric move since Veil is Ghost type, so I switch into Nuzleaf who resists it. Here, I had to hope that he went for Thunder Wave so I could use Priority Fake Out, but he outprioritizes us with Quick Attack after all those attack boosts, and we live on 5 HP. Oh my god. At this point, I'm thinking he'll likely go for Quick Attack since we're such low health, so I switch into Veil, and he does, and we're immune to it. Since he can't use Quick Attack to outprioritize our Fake Out either, we can hit it, and it takes him out. Absolutely unreal. I celebrated so damn hard after this, it's not even funny. This gym alone caused me to be unsure if I'd even get this video up on time for you guys, and even as I write this script, I'm doubting it, so let's hope I can. After a long trek to Fall Arbor Town, one of the kids in the houses offers us the Dig TM. After all we just went through with an electric-type gym, now you give us this? Come here, you little sh**. 
With their next level cap being 29, many battles to go before the fourth gym leader and no other encounters available before that, I attached the experience share to Cuddy Boy in the hopes that we might make it. At the top of Mount Chimney we have another scary battle, this time against Team Magma leader Maxi. He leads with Mighty Ina, so I send in Deku so the Intimidate isn't a terrible thing. I hit him with Fake Out first, then Bullet Seed which hits only twice. He only has Bite as his best attack, which we resist, but this matchup takes a while, especially since we brought him into Super Potion range and we got hit by Sand Attack, so we're brought to just 24 HP before taking him out. Maxi sends in Camera up next, so I switch in Mighty Ina for the Intimidate to weaken Magnitude. Our Bites do bring him into Potion range though, but thankfully we got a flinch on one, so he brings us to 33 HP before we KO him. Zubat is his final Pokemon, and a switch into Sableye is able to bring him into the red, although with Confusion I was forced to switch again into Mighty Ina for the Intimidate, and a bite does take him out. Our entire team was weak after that, but we managed it well. All these battles have got me fatigued, so I take up this old lady's offer to join her in the hot springs. Don't judge, strictly platonic. It's time for Lombridge Town's Fire Gym with our Pokemon very close to the level cap at all 28 or 29, and one that, yep, I had to wipe against once, meaning what you saw was actually the second time I had to beat Watson. You can imagine how I'm feeling at this point. Flannery's battle is just... Ugh, there's no way around her Torkoal. There just isn't, especially since she has a camera up too in Emerald. Along the way through her gym, Sableye learns Faint Attack, and I teach Mighty Ina the Dig TM. With our best setup and having made it right to the level cap, it's time to see what we can do. Flannery leads with a new mole as I lead Mighty Ina so I can get the Intimidate off for Magnitude. Now the key here is that I have to have a plus 6 attack to take the Torkoal out with Dig. Otherwise, we get taken out by Overheat without a doubt since it has a white herb to mitigate the Overheat special attack drop after dealing with her other three Pokemon, but setting this up is immensely difficult given that all her Pokemon have Overheat and Sunny Day. But I have a bit of a plan. I actually switch into Sableye here and she went for a takedown amazingly enough. I switch back into Mighty Ina to get another Intimidate off and she hits a Magnitude 9 which thankfully doesn't do too much after the double Intimidate. I switch again and she goes for Overheat which does over half on Veil but Overheat lowers the special attack of course. Perhaps now you can see my strategy. I switch back into Mighty Ina to Intimidate and unfortunately she goes for Sunny Day meaning Sableye now can't handle another Overheat with the Sun Boost so it's time. I go for Howl several times until we're brought to 34 HP due to the Sun Boost, but his special attack gets lowered again and our Orin Berry activates. According to the calcs, the Soft Sand isn't really helpful here since the extra 10% doesn't really factor in in KOs or anything, but the Orin Berry helps us get all the boosts that we need off. But then, Numo gets a crit takedown, but we survive with just 10 HP left. We have to go for it. Now this isn't a foolproof plan, as we have to go for Dig here since nothing else will one hit KO, and the Numal does have Magnitude which can hit while we're underground, but she just goes for Overheat instead, thank god. From here, at plus 6, Dig is a one hit KO on Slugma and on Camrupt, and the Torkoal also goes down even with its base 140 defense. I'm gonna go ahead and say that without getting Mighty Ina to plus 6, that battle is impossible in a dark hardcore Nuzlocke of Emerald without getting absolutely insane luck with a crit on Torkoal or something. Four badges down. After this, May gives us the Go Goggles which allow us to finally get a new encounter in the desert part of Route 111, a Cacnea. However, Cacnea is only a 6% chance and the Trap Hinge here mostly have Arena Traps so we have to take them out, which isn't good for the level cap. I'm not kidding when I say we almost had to ignore it and come back after the gym due to the cap, but we found one in the nick of time. I caught it and named it Poker, and it ends up having a plus defense and minus speed nature. Not great, but not quite the worst it could have been, I suppose. It's time to hit up the Pedalberg Gym. The first trainer in the gym is in the speed room, and he says the ability to move before the opponent, just that alone puts me at a great advantage. Don't you agree? Then we proceed to use Fake Out and move faster than it. Take that, you crafty son of a... Hey, whoa, 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 easy, easy. We have some close calls with the gym trainers, but Vale's ghost typing and Shenzi's intimidate definitely help out. After grinding Cacnea to level 31, who unfortunately doesn't evolve until level 32 just after the cap, it's time for Norman. He starts off with a Spinda, and I lead Sableye. His Spinda doesn't have any move that can hit us except for Teeter Dance, so I hit him with Fake Out on the first turn, and then a couple Faint Attacks can take it out after we got hit by Teeter Dance since we don't hit ourselves in confusion. Vigoroth comes out next, and he can only hit us with Faint Attack, which is a special move, and resisted, and and his special attack isn't great, but we did hit ourselves in confusion once. Our second attack brings him into the red, so Norman heals him with the Hyper Potion, but we got a crit on our second one afterwards to take him out. Nice. 
In comes Slacking, who hits us with Feint Attack, and we survive on just 5 HP and can hit him once with a bit of damage. Now here, I had a ridiculous strategy to deal with this thing. I switch into Mighty Ina for the Intimidate on the turn that he's loafing around due to Truant, after which I switch back into Sableye, assuming he's going to go for a normal move on Mighty Ina, which he does, so we're unaffected. I can then Intimidate him again by switching, essentially making it so that he can't really do any damage on Mighty Ina in the end so that we can charge up our attack with Howl. However, he does have Yawn, which kind of messes up our strategy a bit, and he is faster than Mighty Ina, so we unfortunately can't do a dig strategy where we're underground every time he attacks, then above ground every time he has a Truant turn, but Rock Smash, after some charging up, does a good job, especially with the defense drops, and we can always switch into Sableye on the Yawns. It takes a long time, but eventually the slacking goes down to a dig since I didn't want to bring him into Hyper Potion range with Rock Smash. Norman's Linoon does have Belly Drum, but other than that it just has normal moves, so it's easily handled by Vale with his ghost typing. A bit messy, but a solid strategy for sure to win us our fifth badge. Following this gym, we have our first evolution in a while as Cacnea evolves into Cacturn, which should be a great help despite having the same typing as Nuzleaf. Before we advance, I go back to grab the Meteorite from Mount Chimney for a reason that I'll show in a bit, but first we actually encountered Mirage Tower in the desert, so I made the journey to the top where it warns us if we take a fossil, the entire thing will collapse. So I did it. No more pain of having to deal with trainers like Watson. But we survive on 1 HP and I landed ass first on the Claw Fossil. Anyway, back to the Meteorite, you can actually return it to Professor Cosmo at his house in Fall Arbor where he'll give you the Return TM, which is 102 base power at max friendship, so it should come in handy eventually. Surfing east from Mauville, we get to Route 118 where we can get the Good Rod, which opens up two new encounters for us right off the bat, which is much needed since all our Pokemon are already at level 32 or 33, and the cap is 33 with a long stretch to the next gym. First, we can literally just turn around and fish here where Carvana can be caught, which immediately has the water and dark typing. We catch one and name it Nato, and it ends up having a naughty nature plus attack and minus special defense, which isn't that bad. Problem is, water and dark are both special types in this gen, and Sharpedo is a way better physical attacker, but hey, it's a new encounter. We can also head back to Petalburg, where we can fish in the little pond to catch a Corefish. Although it has the same typing and the same stat situation as Sharpedo eventually, Corefish itself is only a water type, so we'll have to use the experience share until it evolves. We name it Waddle and find out it has a plus defense and minus special defense nature, which is meh. Good defensively for super effective fighting types, but bad for electric and grass. Along the way, I realize the path to Route 123 is open where I know Giga Drain is, but it looks like we're blocked off by the ledges. Maybe that's it right there. Or maybe that. Damn. Little girl, can you pick up that TM for me, please? Just, just right over there. Alright, so from the future here, that's embarrassing. It's not even the TM. It's like a nugget or something. Let's get out of here. The stretch to Fortry is made easier by the rain, which boosts our water moves on Carvana, and by the fact that it quickly evolves into a Sharpedo at level 30. 95 base power surf in the rain does wonders, even if it's a special attack. This guy here says, I thought you fly by catching a whole flock of bird Pokemon and then hanging on to them somehow. Bruh. I then go inside the house and there's just Wingle everywhere. <laughs> His poor wife, she looks traumatized just shaking her head in the corner. What have I done? <laughs> While battling Team Aqua at the Weather Institute, Corfish evolves into a beautiful Crawdont, meaning it's officially usable. The team's really starting to stack up now. The cast form that we get for saving the place also has the Mystic Water item attached, which is fantastic for our new catches. The water pathway up ahead also leads to a Leaf Stone, which we can use immediately on Nuzleaf to evolve it into a Shiftry. Fun fact, before Kingdra, my channel mascot was actually Shiftry. He's a cool dude, but admittedly hideous. Now that we have a water type in the rain with the mystic water, Mei is a sweep through, especially her combuskin, which would otherwise be a big threat. Sorry, Mei. We love you. We also encounter Steven on the bridge who says, show me your power as a trainer, and throws us at a Kecleon. I proceed to just run, and he goes, your battle style is intriguing. Do you just like say words. After arriving in Fortree, I'm a bit nervous about Winona's battle, but I remembered something. In the Mauville Game Corner, you can get the Ice Beam TM for 4,000 coins. This ends up costing us like $90,000, almost everything we have, but I'm hoping it will be worth it. I teach it to NATO and get ready for battle. Winona leads with Swablu, I start with Sharpedo and hit it with Ice Beam, and it doesn't KO, but she gets frozen, but then defrosts. Alright, what even is this battle already? 
After she heals it up, we're able to take it out in two more hits. Tropius comes out next, which is a big threat with his grass typing, but it's four times weak to ice and we outspeed it, so it's a one hit. Pelipper then comes in, and I figure it can't do much to Sharpedo besides maybe confuse us, but it just spans Protect and we can take it out with a few crunches. Skarmory comes out and tanks a Surf with one third health left, then uses Sand Attack on us, but we hit the Surf nonetheless. This mother don't miss. Oh, we miss the Ice Beam on Altaria, it then goes for Dragon Dance and then Earthquake which brings us to just 35 HP but then our 4 times super effective Ice Beam lands, but it survives on what must be 1 HP. My god. I know she's gonna potion it up though, so I go for Ice Beam again, it lands and gets a higher roll to take it out this time. That could have been scary, although I suppose we could have switched in Mightyena to intimidate it. Wow, much crazier battle than I expected. While traveling on Route 120, we're able to find our 7th and final encounter, an Absol, which is an 8% chance to find here. After finding one, it turns out it has Swords Dance, and because of the low capture rate and it powering up its attack like crazy, it was a risky one and a lot of our team got hurt, but we successfully captured it. I name it Harbinger, and it has a hasty nature, plus speed, and minus defense. Not terrible, but we'll have to watch out for fighting types. On the way to Lily Cove City, we have a bit of an item bonanza as we pick up the Shadow Ball TM at the top of Mount Pyre, which I'm gonna hold on to for the moment as Sableye already learns it by level up at 41. We pick up the Sea Incense on the floor below after falling yet again, which I put on Crawdon since Sharpedo already has the Mystic Water, and we also get the Giga Drain TM from Route 123 south of Mount Pyre, which I teach to Deku. Since he doesn't get any Grass-type moves, then Poker will already learn Needle Arm. With that, it's time to awaken Groudon. Damn, he's got some hops! Maxi says he's seen us poking around uninvited here and there, and Poker is just there sweating with shifty eyes. The battle with Maxi is looking pretty scary on the face of it as he leads with Mightyena. I decide to go in with Crawdont who has Hypercutter so her attack can't be lowered but Mightyena goes for Swagger. We break through it to hit it with Surf for about a quarter, then we break through Confusion and go for Vice Grip since we have higher attack and the Swagger boost. But it does about the same in the end. We get hit by Takedown before taking him out, and then Crobat comes out next which I'm a bit scared about since it has Confuse Ray, Bite to Flinch, and Air Cutter and I don't really want to switch into that so I go for Vice Grip. Wing Attack hits us to below half and we can KO from this range, but Maxi uses a potion even from that health point, and he's a KO in one more hit, so I go for Vice Grip again. He hits us with Wing Attack, and... Critical hit. Are you kidding me? Crawdont goes down. What are the odds? We were totally fine without that crit, and I was nervous about switching due to Confuse Ray. Definitely an unnecessary loss, but hey, this kind of stuff happens in Nuzlocke's. Looks like Absol's on the team. While taking on the Aqua Hideout, we have a double battle, and we send out Absol together with Mighty Ina. Nothing too crazy with the battle, but damn if this isn't one of the coolest tag teams in the game. Following that, we arrive in Moss Deep City and take on the Gym Trainers. We had one close call with Metatite's High Jump Kick, but aside from that, it's a smooth ride since it is a Psychic-type gym after all. With that being said, I am not risking it with Tate and Liza after all my traumatic experiences with them, so I spend forever grinding up to the level cap, during which Sableye learns Shadow Ball, and it's time to go for it. Now this is one of those gyms that gets real upgraded in Emerald, as Tate and Liza now have four Pokemon instead of two. And as much as it would be nice to roll in there with Sharpedo and surf everything, their Zatu has Sunny Day, and Claydol's special defense is ridiculous, along with it and Lunatone having Light Screen. I decide to lead with Sableye and Shiftry instead, since Shiftry resists Earthquake at least. Zatu doesn't have anything that can hit Dark types offensively, so I decide to target the other Pokemon repeatedly and keep Zatu on the field, since it's kind of a dead weight for their team. I use Shadow Ball and Giga Drain on Claydol as Zatu uses Calm Mind. Earthquake does about half on Sableye, but not much on Shiftry, and another Shadow Ball is able to take Claydol out. Soul Rock comes in and gets KO'd by a combination of Shadow Ball and Giga Drain, and the same happens to Lunatone before we can then take the Zatu out safely. If Zatu had anything that could hurt us, that would have gone much worse with Flamethrower, Light Screen, Calm Mind, Sunny Day, Solar Beam, etc. on their team, but even Sunny Day does help Shiftry's speed too, and that ground resistance was crucial. Overall, a great strategy, and that's our 7th badge. Following this, we have a crazy but manageable double battle with Steven against Maxi, and also take out the Team Aqua hideout and defeat Archie with a few close calls. Along the way to Sutopolis, we explore Pacific Log Town, where you can get a second return TM, which is fantastic. Would highly recommend getting these if you guys are doing an Emerald run of your own. After Sutopolis is taken over by Groudon and Kyogre, we desperately need to find the legendary dragon Rayquaza to save the entire world. Hey Rayquaza, I... Oh. Uh, okay then. Hey, children. Shut the f*** up. Okay, sorry daddy. 
And with that, it's time to take on the eighth and final gym leader, Juan, the water trainer, who I'm feeling all right about since we have Shiftry and Cacturn. Good old Deku and Poker, what a duo. That should be a TV show. Juan starts with Love Disc and I send out Shiftry. I go for Fake Out right away so that it's an easy KO with Giga Drain afterward. Celio comes out next and Giga Drain just barely doesn't KO and we get hit by Aurora Beam, but since I knew it wouldn't KO, I knew we would get our health back with Giga Drain so it's not too big of a concern. Kingdra though is a bit of an issue since it's not weak to grass, so I send out Nato who resists all of its moves. It goes for Double Team which is worrying and Slash doesn't do a whole lot as we start missing since it won't stop double teaming so we get overwhelmed and brought to 14 HP. I switch into Sableye here and accidentally accidentally clicked Fake Out instead of Faint Attack, which can't miss, and of course Fake Out misses so we get brought to 33 HP. Yikes. I send in Absol next since I know we need to outspeed and do big damage, so I go for Slash and we get a critical hit to take it out. Thank god, although we would have survived another Water Pulse, but we could have gotten confused. Our only other guaranteed Faint Attack was on Cacturn, who's weak to Ice Beam. From there, we can get Shiftry going again, who one hit KOs both Whiskash and Crawdont with Giga Drain. Kingdra is literally the mascot of my channel, yet it always betrays me. A tough battle, but it could have gone much worse. After the battle, Juan says, You are lacking in elegance. Perhaps I shall make you a loan of my outfit? Yeah, give me all your clothes, baby. That's all eight badges acquired, and it's time for Victory Road. Wally encounters you right at the start of Victory Road in Emerald, and his Magneton makes the battle very difficult as we have no good way to counter it, and it causes confusion and paralysis. But thankfully, while confused, Cacturn lands a hugely necessary Leech Seed to guarantee damage and recovery. Aside from that, his Gardevoir can't hit us aside from Future Sight, which, yes, despite being Psychic, can hit Dark types, and Double Team is handled by Faint Attack. Our team did get hurt bad, and we almost lost Shenzi and Poker, but we made it through. Wally says his goodbyes, and then then, uh, so, you, you just gonna stand there? After a long journey through the rest of Victory Road, we finally arrive at the Pokemon League. I do some thorough preparation by grinding everyone to 53 since the level cap for Drake is 55. I fill out the rest of our EVs. I teach Mightyena and Absol Return, Shadow Ball to Mightyena as well, Earthquake to Sharpedo, and I get the Silk Scarf from Duford and Spell Tag by using Thief on Wild Duskull. With that, it's time. Let's say our prayers. First up is Sydney, our dark type arch nemesis. Since he starts out with Intimidate Mightyena, I lead with Sableye. Since Mightyena has sand attack, Sableye is our only reliable choice here since its keen eye ability prevents accuracy drops. Our second faint attack brings it to the red, but it tries to go for sand attack, after which Sydney uses a full restore. It's a lengthy grind, but our citrus berry helps restore our health and we bring it back to the red with a crit, but we're getting too low, so I switch into Absol, who tanks a crunch, and then outspeeds it to take it out with return. Shiftry comes out next, and this is a perfect opportunity to set up. The most he has against us is Swag but he goes for double team instead. I taught Absol Aerial Ace, which can't miss, so after a Swords Dance, we're able to take him out and sweep through the entire rest of his team with a combination of Aerial Ace and return with the Silk Scarf item attached. Solid. Next up is Phoebe, the Ghost Type Elite 4 member who, despite being weak to us, I'm not underestimating. Since Return doesn't affect her Pokemon and Bite is special, Sword Stance with Absol isn't a great option, especially since Dusclops has both Confuse Ray and Curse, which could ruin a setup big time. Instead, I lead with Mightyena for the Intimidate and stab Super Effective Crunch, which does about two-thirds, and then Dusclops goes for Curse to take itself out. The curse damage does a quarter, but I'm feeling safe against Banette, so I go for Crunch again, which brings it into the red, but then we get brought to 51 HP. I figure she'll full restore here, but don't want to risk it, and can use the potion turn to switch out of curse, so I go into Cacturn to use Growth, since I know she'll probably try to burn us, and that doesn't affect our special attack. Faint Attack is then able to take it out after we get hit by Shadow Ball. Phoebe then sends in her higher level Dusclops though, which does have Ice Beam, so I switch in Nato who resists it. Earthquake does do a lot to us, but two crunches are able to do the job after Dusclops' Citrus Berry. She then sends out her second Banette, which I know has Thunderbolt, but my calcs tell me Crunch will do the job anyway, and it does indeed. Sableye is her last Pokemon, and not wanting to risk a crit, I switch into Shiftry and use Growth, after which Sableye goes down to a Faint Attack since it just used Double Team. Little more complicated than you'd imagine for a trainer who's weak to us, but we made it work. The third Elite Four member is the Ice-type trainer Glacia, and she's the one that I'm terrified of. Yes, we have two Grass types for her three Water types, but all five of her Pokemon are Ice as well. She sends out Celio as I go for Shiftry to start. I hit it with Fake Out on the next turn to hopefully put it into Giga Drain KO range on the next, and it does indeed work. 
That first Celio only had Ice Ball anyway, so I wasn't too worried. The next, though, has Blizzard, but I'm hoping she'll go for Hail, as she really likes to set that up as soon as possible, and she does indeed. Giga Drain then brings it almost to the red, but after a full restore, two more can take it out. In comes Walray next, and this is the one that I was worried about. I had no surefire strategy for dealing with it. I send in Sharpedo, though, who resists its moves besides Body Slam. Even Resisted Ice Beam does nearly half though, and Hail brings us below half, but I know the Hail will end next turn, so I hit it with Crunch for a bit above half. It goes for Sheer Cold instead, and thankfully misses. Not wanting to bring it into full restore range, I go for a couple Surfs, then it hits us with Ice Beam to just 5 HP, after which we can take it out with Crunch. That was way too close for comfort. In comes Glalie, and I need to switch, but I don't have any good options for tanking Ice Beam, and it probably outspeeds everything on our team besides NATO. I switch into Mighty Ina for the Intimidate in case it uses Explosion, and it hits us with Ice Beam to just above half. Knowing we can survive another, I go for Return, which does about a third. Then she sets up Hail, which brings us below half, but our Citrus Berry restores us to where I know we can hit it with Return again. Another Ice Beam and Hail brings us to 25 HP, and I'm forced to switch into Sableye here, but it combined with the Hail does just too much damage. I slightly miscalculated, and now we can get taken out by Ice Beam. Uh-oh. Due to the possibility of Explosion and Ice Beam outspeeding and hurting the rest of our team badly, there's nothing else I can do though. I have to go for Priority Fake Out, even though it won't flinch due to its inner focus ability and hope for the KO. But it doesn't, and Veil vale goes down. Ouch. It was a sacrifice for sure, as now we can send in Absol freely and take out both Glalies with Return, thanks to a crit on the first and Light Screen from the second. Losing Sableye is definitely not good, but we made it through at least. The final Elite Four member is Drake the Dragon Trainer, and another one who scares me quite a bit. He leads with Shellgon, and I go for Absol since I know the Shellgon likes to spam Protect to start, so it gives us a good opportunity to Swords Dance. After two Swords Dances, I know I'm pushing it, and Shellgon hits us hard with Double Edge to right about half, so I go for Return to take it out. Altaria comes out next, who's another one hit KO with Return, and the same goes for Kingdra and Flygon too. Amazing. We're 4 for 4 with Absol. However, Salamence is his last Pokemon, and it comes in immediately with the Intimidate. The best strategy I have for this thing is to bring in Mightyena for the Intimidate, which goes off smoothly, but Shenzi gets hit to below half with Dragon Claw even after that Intimidate. Man, that thing is powerful. Here, I decide to switch in Shiftry, knowing a Dragon Claw can be tanked, and we get to below half. Now, this may look weird, but Shiftry is sent out here to bait the Flamethrower so that I can send in Sharpedo, who resists it, and outspeed with the Ice Beam, four times effective guaranteed KO. The bait indeed works as it goes for Flamethrower, but then Salamence somehow outspeeds and takes Sharpedo down. I don't understand. I calculated everything. It wasn't until later when I reviewed our team and actually calculated our IVs that I found out NATO literally has zero IVs in speed. Zero. With the 198 speed EVs we have on it, that causes it to be a direct speed tie. And the Salamence just happened to win it. Literally one IV in speed out of 31 would have won it for us hands down. This is absolutely devastating. Since Salamence has Flamethrower, I can't send in Cacturn, Shiftry is below half, and so is Mightyena. But I need another Intimidate so that Absol might be able to survive something. I send out Shenzi for Intimidate, and then Salamence immediately takes it down with Dragon Claw after three Intimidates. Harbinger is my only choice from here, and we do have speed and can get good damage off with Return to below half, but Dragon Claw takes it out as well. Both of our remaining Pokemon are outsped with super effective Flamethrower from a Salamence. I send in Cacturn, Salamence's Citrus Berry also activates, and it goes for Flamethrower. But we survive on just 7 HP, but we get burned. Holy shit. I then go for Faint Attack, and it takes it out. Because we won, the battle ends right there, and we don't get burn damage either. Unreal. Absolutely unreal. With just two Pokemon left, it's time for the champion, Wallace. I mean, we do have two grass types, and he is a water trainer, so maybe? Let's try it out. I use our last couple rare candies on them, have the Miracle Seed on Shiftry, and a Citrus Berry on Cacturn, and go for it. 
Wallace leaves with Waylord and I send out Shiftry. I go for Fake Out right away and now I know that our only hope is to charge up with Growth. I know he has Blizzard but he goes for Rain Dance right away as I expected and I know we can live one Blizzard so I go for another Growth. The Waylord then misses Blizzard so I go for yet another on the next turn, then it hits us down to just 25 HP after which a Giga Drain takes it out and recovers us back to nearly full health. Milotic comes out next and actually outspeeds us but misses its Toxic, but Giga Drain just barely doesn't take it out in the red. It then outspeeds us and hits us with Ice Beam and gets a crit. No way, are you kidding me? Cacturn is next and Ice Beam brings us down to just 2 HP, then we can take it out with Needle Arm. Tentacruel comes out, our Citrus Berry brings us to 32 HP, but of course it outspeeds us, lands a Hydro Pump and takes us out. Man, oh man, absolutely brutal luck towards the end. Zero speed IVs on Sharpedo on a really great strat, then a crit ice beam from Milotic. But hey, that's how hardcore Nuzlocke's go, honestly. Nonetheless, we made it through to the champion with a maximum of 7 encounters and a type that is honestly really, really frail. I think that's the main difficulty we faced here in addition to poor type coverage early on. A really intriguing and challenging run for sure and definitely possible as we've shown. I had a ton of fun with it though and I hope you guys did too. If you enjoyed the run, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button, it really helps a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who help make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoy, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.